Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and I'm back from my annual pilgrimage to the Palisades Tahoe for the most important, and more importantly, the most fun event of the year in skiing, the Payne McSchlonky Invitational, a.k.a. the PMS. This is the weekend where a collective of Shane's friends, family, and strangers who loved him converge on Palisades Tahoe, USA to celebrate the life and spirit of Shane McConkie. And the best way to do that is to get weird on a day where we crown the king and queen of snowblading with the PMS downhill complete with golden saucers, not to be confused with showers of the same color. And I don't know if it was the pandemic or something, but more people than ever seemed to participate in the madness. There were so many great outfits and so many snowbladers, it was a perfect day. And while I had planned on recording a podcast of McConkie stories like I did last year, I didn't have time. I mean, I was in celebration mode too. I can say that I spent way too much time at the slot bar putting back cold ones, meeting podcast listeners, and hanging with the amazing local community of the Pali Valley. I'll say that in my experience, no community likes to party like the local population at a rad ski mountain, and there was no shortage of fun guys and girls in Palisades Tahoe. There are almost too many people to thank for this weekend, so I'm going to go with my top three. First and foremost, Sherry McConkie. She works so hard every year to put on an incredible event, and although she doesn't mention it, there has to be a lot of emotion and pain around this one. I mean, she lost a loved one, and we celebrate him every year. Thank you, Sherry. Next up, I need to thank my partner in crime on the microphone, Roy Tuscany. I love seeing Roy, and when we're on the mic together, our chemistry always makes it fun and special. Finally, I want to thank Scotty at the slot bar for keeping me overhydrated all weekend. You're the man. So that was an incredible weekend celebrating a once in a lifetime dude who knew how to live, and unfortunately, he had an accident and died. Speaking of living like McConkie and skydive accidents, my guest this week has done both. Tyler Turner is a Paralympic gold medalist who used to jump out of planes until he had an accident. Actually, he still jumps out of planes, but the story is he used to jump out of them, had an accident, and he's come back. And everyone knows that when accidents happen in skydiving, they usually have a bad ending but not for Tyler. Well, while the accident part of his story really sucks, he didn't die. And after a lot of pain and hard work, Tyler's living a bigger life than he's ever lived before. It's a heavy and awesome podcast. And before we get into it, I want to ask you to subscribe to the show wherever you listen. If it's on Spotify, please star rate me when you pull up the show as it not only helps the show grow, but it makes me feel better about myself. What also makes me feel better about myself is when you follow me on Instagram at the Powell Movement and when you support my amazing sponsors who make the show happen, they are Rollerblade, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Elon Skis, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and Stanley. Now, let's talk with Tyler Turner. There are so many ways that I could start this podcast out, but I didn't want to steal the thunder of the whole podcast in the intro. So I'm going to start out with your living situation, and it sounds like you and your girlfriend live on a sailboat. How long have you been living the water life? It's been a couple years i guess well since i got out of like care homes and hospitals and stuff we've been mostly on the boat but my girlfriend like she grew up on a boat her family been doing this for a long time so yeah she comes from a long history of it and i'm new to it so it's been a couple years now is it true that your girlfriend exclusively refers to the boat as the stabbing cabin (laughs) i've never heard that so i guess the answer is no fair enough we'll leave it at that how big is your boat uh, Tartan 42. Okay. And when you have to take a big dump, does it just totally stink up the whole boat? Yeah, I guess so. But you can, uh, you know, open some windows. Luckily in this boat, our last boat, it was pretty open. This one, uh, the head is its own area. So you can close some doors kind of like you would normally in a house. How about cleaning the shit water? Is it like living in an RV where you're hooked up all the time when you're docked? Yeah, so we have two different heads, and, and one toilet is goes into a black water tank, so it can either get sucked out, or once you're out in the open ocean, it goes overboard, and the other one is direct overboard, so it just depends where you are. So when you're out in the open ocean, your shit and everything's just, you're letting it fly for the fish? Yeah, it goes right overboard. 
What's wild to me about living on a boat is that you have no feet and the boat is not the most stable place to live on. Have you ever fallen off or had any accidents on the boat because of just your balance? I'm actually super surprised. I've never fallen off the boat because of my prosthetics. But yeah, I take a lot of spills on there. And then especially when we're sailing, uh, you got to be heads up. There's handles everywhere, though. So kind of always three points contact is a pretty good rule on there. And what's the strangest thing that you've encountered living on a boat that people might not think about? Ooh, I, don't know, I think the perpetual motion, but everyone thinks about that. I guess water usage is so critical and knowing when the next time you're going to be able to fill up with water is. And before you were born on a boat, you were born in Saskatoon, which is the largest city in Saskatchewan. How long are you there before the family moves to Calgary, Alberta? Uh, good pronunciations there. I was in Saskatoon only for a couple of years and then a quick stint in Vancouver and then oh, it's 20 years in Calgary or something. I love Calgary. And what line of work is the family in? My dad was in like meat snacks and beef jerky growing up. Does that make you rich, poor, or average? I know beef jerky is an expensive snack. I know whenever I go to the store, it's like if I get the big bag, it's like $14. Are you rich off of beef jerky or is it just like a good middle class life? Yeah, beef's got a little crazy these days, so you got to go for the turkey jerky. It's a little cheaper, but I'm super grateful. Like, growing up, I had everything I needed and stuff. We were able to go skiing, so I guess that's the level right there is that we were able to go to the mountains to go skiing as a family. But, yeah, far from rich, but I'm very grateful for what we had growing up. Yeah, it sounds like far from rich, far from poor, though. You're able to do everything. If you can go ski, that means you have enough money to do the fun things in life that are privileges, per se. and Growing up, are you a normal Canadian in the fact that you played hockey and it was a big thing that you were passionate about? Of course, man. Yeah, that was life. Hockey's life for sure. I played from as young as I could skate, like three or four years old or something. And then all the way to, yeah, I played till I was 18 and then had some time off. It got a little too serious there in high school. And so got away from it and was snowboarding more and then got back in the beer leagues later on when I was uh, in my 20s. So is it high school where you're getting into the mountains and finding surf as well? So you're playing hockey throughout the whole time, but then, you know, family goes on ski trips and you go surfing as well? Yeah, I got to go surfing, I think for the first time, like on a family trip to Hawaii when I was like 13 or 14. Absolutely loved it. Always like growing up watching, I don't know, Point Break and Dogtown and the Z-Boys, all that stuff. Always wanted to surf. So I was stoked and I got an opportunity to do it and then went for another trip to California, maybe later on when I was 15 or 16. And so as soon as I graduated high school, I got to the West Coast of Canada and, and got to really sink my teeth into surfing and just been addicted to it ever since. You've been bitten by the bug and are addicted to surfing, but at the same time, snowboarding seems like what you're really, really passionate about. And you have a mountain, I think, that you can go ride every night after school. Is that something that happens in high school where you're going five times a week and you just can't get enough of snowboarding? Yeah, absolutely. Even before high school, like my mom would drive us to COP and we'd get to ride pretty much every night. It was open until nine o'clock. And yeah, COP is definitely one of the reasons why I love snowboarding as much as I do. We just got to ride the park every night after school. Is that the Calgary Olympic Park? Canada Olympic Park. Yeah, it's where the 88 Olympics were based out of. Okay. And you've got a crew that's hitting the local contests, and snowboarding's a serious thing for all of you guys, given it's a super fun thing, but it's something that you're really serious and passionate about, and it defines you and some of the crew. Are some of your crew good enough to get sponsored when you're coming up? Yeah, I mean, everyone was crushing it, and I was like a perpetual intermediate when compared to those guys. But yeah, lots of friends were making it and are still doing things, and uh, it's pretty cool to see that, like, this little group of kids from Calgary in, like, the late 90s, early 2000s gone on to do some pretty big things in snowboarding. So, yeah, I'm grateful that I got to, like, be a part of that growing up. And was there anybody in that crew that I would have heard of? Yeah, I mean, from COP, well, Jed Anderson, yep. Dwayne Weeb, and Jordan Phillips, and, oh, my brain doesn't work as well as it once did. But, yeah, well, Dustin Craven, there you go. He just won natural selection. Yeah, that was huge. And then who were your pro influences that you had coming up? Like if you went in your room and there's snowboard posters on the wall, who were the people that we were going to see? I mean, everyone from that era. But, you know, funny enough, I had the Mark Fawcett photo 
on my wall growing up, which is pretty funny because he's now my coach. The Dan Egan shot? Yeah, the spraying the skiers. Yep. Yeah, that's one that I remember was on there. And yeah, anything I could rip out of magazines. But I always loved rails when I was younger. I wasn't good at them myself, but loved watching rail riding. And then later on, got into wanting to watch people spray power around. And it seems like the one thing that you were into when you were younger from an academic perspective, and I don't know if it's academic if you call it this, but it's a class you take is photography. And are you able to incorporate that into your snowboarding? Like when all your buddies are getting on rails and the rails are too burly for you, are you taking photos of it and kind of developing that skill? Absolutely. That was my like, that was my way to cop out of hitting a lot of this stuff is uh, <laughs> I got a camera pretty young and it was sweet. I got to watch my friends do really well and get some photos and kind of like kept me involved because you know we'd show up to contests and I'd have friends you know hitting the podium and stuff and doing well and I'd be stoked to just not get last so when I started taking photos uh it was a lot of fun because I got to stay involved with all that and yeah it was, it was a good time and it gives you a pass to go backstage and where you're not supposed to be almost because you're taking photos everywhere so it's almost like your all access pass is just your camera yeah just a way to keep hanging out with my friends even though it wasn't good enough <laughs> Well, it's a way to add value. I'd like to look at it that way because your go. friends yeah. are pretty stoked on you taking photos of them, I'm sure. Yeah, totally. And then there's a life-changing trip to Australia. Was that right after high school? Yeah, it was pretty quick after. Yeah, I wanted to go surf, really. It was the big thing. And so I went to Australia and Southeast Asia and just surfed every day. Loved it. And is it pretty much just like you, your backpack, and then are you renting surfboards at different surf spots and you're kind of just backpacking it everywhere? Yeah, we backpacked around for a bit. Classic story, landed in Melbourne and bought a van and just drove the whole East Coast surfing. It was really great. I progressed a lot on that trip. And yeah, it's uh, one of those life-changing trips after high school. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds like a dream trip. And I know that one thing that you check off the bucket list on that trip is going skydiving. And did you have that on a checklist of things you wanted to do in life? Like when you were a kid, were you like, I'm going to fly at some point, and to me that means I'm going to jump out of a plane with the parachute? Or was it just on your road trip in Australia, you kind of pull up to a spot and you're like, hey, I'm going to try that. How did that whole thing come together? Yeah, I really wanted to go skydiving. Honestly, when I was a kid, you know, wingsuiting was kind of making its way into the mainstream. And every time I saw wingsuiting, I, I kept saying I was going to do it someday. And so got an opportunity to go, again, so cliche, but Byron Bay. Australia, you gotta gotta go do a skydive and I did a tandem skydive and as soon as I landed I was like, Yeah, it's not enough. Like I wanna go again, I wanna keep going and I just wanted to keep pushing towards getting being able to jump solo and everything and that definitely hooked me that first jump, but it was years after before I had saved up the money to really get into it. Yeah, you're like 19 at this point. It's not like you can just keep jumping because you're not made of money by any means and you're traveling around Australia. And when you get back home from Australia, is that when you say goodbye to like a normal life and decide you're going to move to the mountains and head up towards Revy? Yeah, I mean, the timeline's even like a little washy in my brain too. But when I came home, yeah, I think I, when did I go out west? Um, man, don't bounce your head off the ground. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty quick after you. I worked hard moving dirt, operating equipment, and kind of just saving up money, advancing myself with education. I was spending more and more time in the backcountry and, you know, getting jobs, operating snowcats, just staying in the industry and kind of working towards wanting to be a tail guide. And then a guide was the ultimate goal. So I was just trying to get as much education as I could, go through all the courses and then, you know, work that muscle, just be out in the backcountry as much as I could. So I'd work super hard operating equipment to make as much time available to go practice in the backcountry. Yeah, when you have one of those snowcat jobs, it's like you're working all night, it seems like, and then you have a lot of your days free. A job like that, is that one of the good jobs to have in a resort town? Like, can you make a good amount of money and get a shit ton of time to go ride? Yeah, I mean, that burnt me out a lot because the night shifts and then you try and hop on in the morning to go chase a line or something and you're just so burnt out and think you can pull it off but then like you've been up for 23 hours right. probably super sketchy and and not the way to do it but you know you got to make it happen and definitely not getting rich driving snowcats it's just barely making enough money to live especially 
the towns you have to live in. They're always the most expensive towns to be in. So I was super lucky. I had a great setup. It was at COP. It was in the city. So not like big fancy mountain town. And that got me in the door, let me cut my teeth and a lot of great mentors there. And I was able to meet some of the best cat drivers in the world that would be coming through building parks for different events and stuff. And then once I had that experience, I was able to leverage it. And then that's what got me out to Revelstoke and working for K3 Cat Skiing. And yeah, that's when I got the sweet job. When you're working at the cat ski operation, are you driving a cat or are you able to go out with the groups? They know the goal is eventually to be a guide, but how do you cut your teeth there as like a heavy machinery operator? And then eventually you're going to work yourself into the crew? Yeah. So sometimes, you know, spend a lot of time driving the school bus, just people up and down to the bottom. But I was also super lucky to be able to build roads there. And road building is awesome. It's one of the scarier things I've ever done. And super fun, exciting. You're out there with this massive machine in the middle of the backcountry, just putting roads up ridges and stuff. It's pretty incredible office to be in. And then I was super lucky with K3 that they were really supportive of me also wanting to advance myself in the guiding world and, and try and move up the ladder there. So I got a lot of tail guiding shifts. If I was road building, I would get to build roads for a bit of the day. I'd get stuck or something would break down or whatever. I'd just hop in a cat and get to hit the afternoon with a group. And that was an amazing job. And I'm really grateful for what they let me do there for some years. And these jobs aren't seasonal and you're not rich. Do you end up being the guy who lives in the van down by the river? Yeah, classic story. You know, in the summer I was rock climbing and trying to get waves, whatever, just trying to find some jobs, whatever, whether it's moving dirt, I guided whitewater rafts, I mow greens at the golf course, work at the brewery, whatever you can do, make some money and yeah, live in a van and keep the money going out as low as possible so you don't have to bring as much in and pretty classic story these days though is this around the time that you're gonna go get your solo permit to skydive yeah i I don't know how the timing all works out but there was a point i remember one summer i was operating uh excavator and working pretty hard and saving up some money and would have been going to revy for the winter and i was like you know what screw it i'm just gonna do it like i kept trying to save up and save up and eventually you just gotta just do it and drop the credit card and lay it down and make it happen. So I just went and did it just outside of Calgary. And yeah, I did my first solo skydive, did the course and everything. And then, yeah, there's no looking back. I was fully addicted and I was all in and it goes from there. Do you become a fixture at the drop zone, like jumping as much as they'll possibly let you and then helping out wherever you can with the hope of getting hired on and having a job at the skydiving operation? Yeah, I was moving around all over the place. So Started out there just outside of Calgary and then jumped a little bit in the interior of BC when I was living in Revy and then eventually landed myself out on Vancouver Island. And that's where I really got in with, you know, a company down in Victoria. And that's it. I was just hanging around as much as I could, do as many jumps as I could. And yeah, get your foot in the door, start getting some licenses and some coach ratings and start going from trying to not spend too much money at the drop zone on the weekend to being there every day and going home with a little money in your pocket. So that was a cool transition when that started happening and I was able to spend more time there because I could afford it and not only afford it, but start making a little bit of money doing it. Yeah, it sounds like you're living the dirtbag dream, summers at the drop zone, winters in the mountains. And when you have time off, is it always a different random adventure to go surf somewhere? Yeah, of course. And, And not just surfing, like whatever it was, speed flying or climbing or surfing like whatever we come up with, definitely fill in every extra moment with some sort of adventure. Speaking of that, are you base jumping and flying wingsuits too? Because it seems like that is the progression once you get enough jumps under your belt. Uh, It's definitely the progression. I was doing my best to hold off doing that. I flew wingsuits a little bit and was just dabbling, but I was trying not to get sucked down that path. Yeah, I knew how that was going to go. And um fully addicted to the whole thing so i was trying to hold off but yeah i was having fun so with your job as a skydive photographer you're jumping out with tandems and shooting video of them i've done this before i was strapped to andy farrington once and his wife shot video of me which is pretty cool but doing that job is it a relatively easy one for you yeah i don't know about easy it was was great it has its challenges and it can get pretty mundane too but what a great way to like go to work for a day and have a day at work doing 
you know, eight, 10 skydives. And what I really enjoy about it is getting to watch people experience it for the first time. And that's what keeps it fun and exciting because it can get a little repetitive. So yeah, I really love it. It was still, it's still one of the best jobs and uh, I still love doing it. Yeah, that sounds like you're not even working. It's like you're doing exactly what you want other than the filming the people part. But when you want to see their reactions, it's great to be filming them because you get that as well. And now I'm going to jump in and talk about your accident, which you really don't remember at all. So I'll start with something you may remember. Did you know that there was another Tyler Turner who a year before you had an accident and died in Lodi, California? Yeah, man, this is the crazy. It's such a crazy story. Like, I don't know. The fact that it's even real is insane. But that day I woke up, I was working at the drop zone, you know, in my van and woke up and had like 60 text messages. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like worried someone in my family died or something. And it was just people asking me if I was alive and stuff. I'm like, what the hell? And yeah, so I Googled it and yeah, Tyler Turner died skydiving. I mean, it's so random. It's so crazy. And even to this day, like if you Google Tyler Turner, it's one of the first things that comes up. Tyler Turner dies skydiving. So it's kind of a really weird, yeah, I don't know. It's just so crazy how that happened. Yeah, because when I was starting to do my research and I Googled Tyler Turner and skydiving and I saw <laughs> that Tyler Turner was dead, I was like, wait a second. I know what Tyler does is risky, but I know he's not dead as well. And I'm glad that you're not dead because there's more to your story and we'll talk about it. Tyler, unfortunately for his family, they lost him, but they won $40 million. And I guarantee they'd rather have Tyler than the money. But with your accident, it seems like you're doing a routine jump and you're filming. And I think you were working on a technical landing maneuver or you don't remember what happens. But I understand that your answers for all my questions relating to your accident are going to be what you've heard and what you've pieced together. So first and least important, I'm guessing that the person that you were filming, that was their first time ever skydiving and you're capturing video of them. Did you ever hear from them after the fact? Like, I'm guessing they'll never, ever skydive again if their first tandem jump, one of the instructors goes down. Did you ever hear anything about the person you were filming? Uh, yes. Like you said, I, this is a lot of this is uh, from other people's stories and stuff. I have very little memory of what happened, but I know that uh, I think it was her mom or something that was there watching was really invested in like coming to the hospital and stuff early on. So yeah, I think for a little bit, they were still involved. I'm sure they're keep up to date with, uh, I don't know, maybe they don't, but that was definitely their last time skydiving. I would imagine, uh, it's a, not how your first skydive should, uh, you should get to experience it. I feel bad about that. It's time for my first sponsor break, and now that ski season is winding down, it's time to think about what's next. And if you're a skier, nothing crosses over like inline skating. It's the only activity that mimics the motions of skiing and delivers the fun and freedom of snow in the dry seasons. On top of that, inline skating will save your knees compared to running, and it gives you more of a full body workout compared to biking. There is no better workout. The Rollerblade brand invented this sport, and they happen to make the most comfortable and highest performance skates on the market. So while ski season is ending, that carving sensation never has to end because Rollerblade makes products that'll keep you carving up the asphalt like you do on the snow during the winter. To find out more about all their amazing products, head on over to Rollerblade.com. My next sponsor is the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been supporting this show for over five years, and they support all the best in ski, snowboard, and bike. From a world-class team of athletes, to standalone movies, to supporting the most important events, Ten Barrel has deep roots in action sports. Product-wise, Ten Barrel not only brews the tastiest beers in the Northwest, their beers are arguably the tastiest in the country, and they also make the best seltzer on the market with their Clean Line seltzers, and their craft cocktails in a can pack a punch. And it should be known that if you want to enjoy any of their amazing products, do it outside because that's what Ten Barrel wants you to do. Drink beer outside because that's where they play. So next time you're at the store, pick up a six pack of Ten Barrel and support the brand that supports the sports we love. To find out more, head on over to TenBarrel.com. My final sponsor this round is Elan Skis. I've been skiing on Elan for the past two years and I absolutely love them. Why? They are lighter and more playful than any ski I've been on in the past decade, but they are also rock solid underfoot when I hit the gas. 
That's because the people that build my Elan skis, well, they are skiers who shred the Slovenian Alps. They understand what skiing is all about, and that's a huge difference I've noticed since my first day on Elan skis, and you will too. I mean, there's a reason the brand is building a cult following in the U.S., and that reason is their skis are better. It's that simple. If you get a chance, demo a pair of Elan skis before the season ends and you're going to be a believer. I highly recommend my quiver of two, the Ripsticks 96 and 106. So if you can get to a demo, check them out. If you can't, you can find out all about the whole range of Elan skis over at elanskis.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Do you have any idea of how fast you were going when you hit the ground? No, you know, I don't really know how fast I was going, but there's no doubt I was going pretty quick. I was like working on doing some higher performance landings and by doing a turn that close to the ground, it causes your speed to increase dramatically. So I'm not really sure how fast I was going, but it was faster than you want to be going when you hit the ground. That's for sure. I mean, if you had to guess, are you going 50 miles an hour? Uh, nope. I don't think I would have been going that quick, but uh, honestly, I don't have a guess. Okay. Yeah, I was going quick. I wasn't going 50 miles an hour. But let's say 30 plus. I don't know. And when a person impacts like that, and you don't remember this, but you've heard stories from people, do you leave a crater in the ground? Because you're, you know, you're probably what, like a 180 pound dude who's going in at 30 miles an hour? Yeah, I wish I was 180 pounds. I was probably about 210 when I had my accident. So I'm a big dude and I hit hard. I bounced. I didn't roll. So I hit pretty straight on. And I guess there was two holes kind of from where my legs went in and I went back but I don't really remember I think there was some remnants of some pretty good dents in the ground so you left your mark and it's pretty crazy that you black out for 60 seconds which has to be the most life-changing 60 seconds that you're ever going to have but do you look at not remembering those 60 seconds and then being in a coma for five days as a blessing like you didn't have to endure the pain yeah, absolutely. Uh, you hit it on the head there, Mike. Right after the accident, I guess I was really like dead set on figuring out what happened. And I was asking everyone, I had a whiteboard in my hospital room, like trying to get people to draw where they thought I went, what they think happened, any information I get. I was like doing this investigation from my hospital bed, I guess. And I really wanted to know. And early on, that was a big one for me. Like I wanted to know. And I was angry that. I thought other people knew what happened and I didn't know. And I actually say the film, which is, you know, named 60 seconds that I'm angry that I don't get to know what happened, but nobody knows what happened. And now I am grateful that I don't remember. And I don't know. I've never had a nightmare. I've never had like those classic things that you always hear about after traumatic injury and, and something as big as this event. I don't struggle with a lot of that stuff. So I am kind of grateful for, my brain just shutting that off and, and forgetting it. Do you ever really figure out how close you were to dying? I mean, was it something where it was like, if you weren't life flighted and at the hospital at this point, he might not have made it? Or did it come to that? No, there was never the like, from my accident, it's funny. It's this like really grand, crazy accident, but I don't have any cool like movie style. Like I woke up and my legs were gone or like, you'll never walk again or, you know, the classic lines. I mean, there's no doubt I was on the edge of dying. And I know the owner of the drop zone is a really good friend of mine, still work for him to this day. And I was just with him a couple of nights ago. He's said before that there wasn't a helicopter. Like they called 911 and everything. And he's a, a SAR tech, a search and rescue technician for the Canadian military. And he said before, you know, a helicopter didn't come. And he's like, if you died, I would have really regretted not forcing a helicopter there or something making this all happen a lot more expedited. So yeah, I, you know, I was close to dying. There's no doubt about that. And probably if I did it a hundred more times, I'd probably die a hundred times. So uh, I got super lucky. Yeah. And when you come to, you're in a drugged fog, I would think that you have no idea what's going on at all. How long does it take for you to really understand your situation? Is it a few weeks after the whole thing happens that it actually sets all in that, oh man, I, I'm fucked. Again, that's where my memory really lets me down. But, you know, from the stories I've heard, like coming out of a coma, maybe a few days after in the ICU, I I mean, I was super aware of how bad it was, I guess, and, and how much my life was changed. No matter how well I healed, like my life was different. So 
Yeah, I realized it pretty early on. But for me, like what I start remembering is, yeah, about a few weeks later, where I was just wrestling with not wanting to live as an amputee. That was my biggest thing. It's like, no, this this isn't for me kind of thing. It's a weird time. Well, I would think that you've spent your whole life living and doing everything you possibly wanted that gave you adrenaline rushes and you're searching out adventure and then it's all taken away from you. And I would think the first, you know, at least for the first couple of months, yeah, living is not even that exciting. Like, oh, I'm going to live and my life's going to suck now. I'm not going to be able to do shit because of all these things that, that happened to me. And given, yeah, it was my fault or I don't even know whose fault it was, but I can't really put blame anywhere because I don't know. But I would think it's just like, yeah, do I even want to live because I can't live like I want to? Yeah, that's the biggest thing is my identity was completely stripped in that moment. And, you know, the next few months, like you said, they sucked. But all I could think about was that also the rest of my life sucks. And I didn't see it being any other way. Like, that was it. That was the reality for me in that moment was that this is it. Yeah, I didn't know how I was going to go on from that spot that I was in at that time. But if there's any lightness through all of this darkness, it's that you organize a date with your girlfriend in the hospital, and I guess you're still in a drugged fog. How do you even think to do something like that? It was like, that's the last thing that you can hold on to, and the one thing you love that you really needed to pull in, and you're going to make it happen regardless? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a, that's a good way to say it. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, definitely. So we'd been together for a few months before my accident, and I don't know, just been apart a little bit for, for like a few weeks before. And well, if you want the whole story, I kind of confessed my undying love. And she was like, just got out of a long relationship. So she's like, ah, I don't know about this right now. And like needed some space. And so we're just kind of enjoying the summer. I was skydiving and surfing every day and just living life. And she was doing her thing. And I don't even remember how this all happened. But I guess that was like one of my things. Like I got to get a hold of Kayleen. And then when I talked to her, I asked her, come to the hospital for a date so it's kind of funny because i don't really remember how it all went down but i've heard the stories all the stories and it, it's pretty cool that it brought us back together and i think we both just thought we were gonna say hi and catch up and see how we've been doing for the summer and then honestly she didn't really leave the hospital for the next two months well yeah i mean five years now so yeah pretty wild and really really grateful for how that all worked out pretty crazy it's amazing and josh duick did the exact same thing so it's like two great canadians kind of doing the same thing <laughs> two gold medalists as well so that gives you i guess some hope of normalcy but you're not going to be normal and you know that what's the list of your injuries well first off duick and i were on a train the other day talking about this because we're in beijing and we were talking about you know like lacy his wife has been really amazing support for kayleen Josh has been really, really great just for me and for us. And they've been so supportive. So really appreciative for everything he's done for me. And uh, yeah, really grateful for their support and guidance through all this because, you know, they'd done it in, in a very similar way. So it was really cool that he was able to help us out. But my list of injuries, let's see, well, I had traumatic brain injury. I like bit my tongue off. That was sweet. Busted a bunch of my teeth. I had to have a ton of dental work done. I broke some ribs, which I didn't know till like i don't know a month later when they were reading it off i'm like i didn't break ribs They're like yeah you did <laughs> um but a bunch of broken ribs was so minor in the grand scheme of things that i didn't even notice them shattered my pelvis on the paper it said innumerable fractures <laughs> so yeah pelvis especially the right side but all the way through like the middle pubis symphysis and everything was just exploded both my feet again it said tib fib and then all the little bones in your body, innumerable fractures. Yeah, I I think that's it, but I think there might be more too. I don't know. It was from my belly button down pretty much was just mashed potatoes. Jesus. And spinal issues are all unique. Does yours require the use of like a catheter for peeing and who knows what for pooping? Or are you able to live a normal life in that respect? Oh yeah, that one that I forgot. L5S1. Yeah, you know, I used a catheter for a while. I'm super, super lucky that I've been able to regain bowel and bladder functions, although not normal. It's still one of the biggest battles I have with this whole injury is bowel and bladder functions. Yeah, it's super frustrating. And I, you know, Duke was on here not too long ago, a few months ago, and he spoke really well about it. Yep. I don't have to deal with 
all those issues, but yeah, some of them. And it's kind of that like silent little secret killer that, you know, it's like, you can't walk. It's like, yeah, well use a wheelchair and whatever the bowel and bladder part of the whole traumatic injury thing is really a killer. And that one wears on you. So yeah, I lost some function there and that one sucks. It gets very frustrating. How about the mobility? How much has the spinal in- injury affected you being able to walk and move? I mean, does it have, you know, effect on your balance? Yeah, both my feet were paralyzed, which is irrelevant now. But yeah, my left foot, which I did have, well, and my right foot might have been paralyzed, I would assume, but when I never found out, it looked like it got blown up. And my left foot had almost no function. I could kind of just wiggle, not even wiggle, I could like flick my big toe if I really thought about it, but yeah, it affected it. My right leg is abductor glute hamstring, super weak. And so I always say like when I'm biking or snowboarding, when I'm doing any of these activities, my right leg's just along for the ride. I kind of just drag it around with my back muscles and yeah, it just adds a little extra flavor on top, I guess. Just a little bonus. (laughs) Yeah. A little parting gift for you there. Great. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, just to make it a little harder in case it wasn't hard enough. Let's make sure your right leg doesn't work too. Yeah. And then you bite your tongue off and like, does it totally come off and they have to reattach it? Yeah, it was super, I mean, it was still attached. It was pouring blood out pretty good, but it was amazing. I still have some little, I don't play with it as much anymore. A little like skin tags on there, but they sewed it back on and like, it was healed before my memory came back. Like my tongue healed before my brain healed even. I've now learned that your tongue is the fastest healing thing in your body or something like that. Yeah, it was amazing how fast it healed. Does it impact your speech, your taste or anything? It did. I wish it impacted my taste because I am a horribly picky eater. So I wish I just didn't taste anything. But <laughs> no, it hasn't done anything. It did impact my speech for a while. Who know it was part my tongue and part my brain injury, but yeah, it doesn't bother me at all anymore. My tongue just seems normal, just with a couple flaps of skin. And then with the TBI, I mean, I'm ignorant when it comes to these. I understand what they are, but I've never had one. And what are the the effects? Do you have amnesia for a while, and do you have difficulty processing and remembering things? Yeah, it mostly affects me in my memory, and it really affected my speech for the first year. Word finding was my biggest issue. I would get stuck on simple, simple words. And then I'd I'd get completely stuck. I would be so frustrated that I couldn't think of like pizza or something, whatever I was trying to say. Yeah. I also didn't know a whole lot about it, you know, growing up doing all these sports, hockey and snowboarding and stuff, pile of concussions. And yeah, we'd always just shake it off the way it used to be dealt with pretty much dust yourself off and keep going. But this one was a, was a whole new level. And Yeah, I struggled with it. I had to go to speech pathology for over a year, trying to figure out how to just talk again. And I still battle it a lot. The memory is the biggest thing that I battle with now. I really, really struggle to remember a lot of simple things. But yeah, it's been a tough one. It's invisible. So it's not like you can look down and be like, yeah, your legs are injured. Like your brain is injured. And then you can't look and see what it is that's injured. You just kind of notice as you go on through day to day that different things just aren't working the way they used to. And yeah, I've got a, a bunch of that stuff that I, I'm still learning and trying to just uh, fill the toolbox with as many tools as I can. So I can avoid the frustration of some of the situations that it brings. And the biggest part of your injury, or it might not be the biggest part, but the most noticeable, I guess, optically are your feet. And you said that one foot looked like it was blown up and they amputate that one right away. Does that happen when you're in a coma? Like, are you involved in that decision or does that happen when you come to and you're involved in the decision? No, that was like an immediate, it's got to come off. There's only one picture of it, actually. I'm really grateful for the person that, that I guess she got yelled at a lot when she took the picture, but I'm so thankful she did take the picture because it's the only time I'll ever see that foot. And it's the last time I saw that foot. And there was no save in that thing. There was bones spread out across the field. So Yeah, that one was amputated immediately when I got to the hospital and I was in a coma for about a week there. So I was not involved. No one was involved in that decision. It had to be had to be done. And then the second one, there was a lot more involvement in having that amputated. Yeah, because I would think when you have the first foot amputated or you wake up and you finally realize that the first foot is gone, 
you have to be so dejected, like, yeah, I'm alive, but what life am I going to have? And that's probably where you have all the thoughts of, I don't even want to be here anymore. And then with amputation, you read a ton about, I read a ton because I haven't had anything amputated, but you experience it, the phantom pain. And is there any way to describe what that is? Oh, man, I've come up with so many different ways to explain it. And yeah, it's kind of something that you've never felt or experienced before. But I've got a few explanations. I'll give them to you. The number one is like what I've got right now. And my legs are off at the moment. And when my legs are off, the ends of my the, my stumps, they're called, they feel like a beehive with bees buzzing inside of them. Oh. And it kind of something like when your foot goes numb and it comes back, that kind of tingly sensation. Yep. But it's not quite that. It's like that sensation if you thought of it as a beehive. And it doesn't hurt per se. But it means that I can't go to sleep with it. And it it just absolutely drives you insane. And I have that probably, I don't know, 80% of the time. Very rarely am I like, my feet aren't buzzing right now or my legs aren't buzzing. And that one, that tests your mental strength. It's just constant. So it's like, yeah, it sucks when your foot goes numb when you've been sitting, you know, in a car for too long or something. But it's going to go away in 30 seconds or two minutes. Like, no, this is never going away. This is going to be there for the rest of your life. And that one. The beehive one really drives me insane. And then the other one that I experience, and, you know, every amputee experiences all these differently, but there's a lot of things that are are similar and not everyone experiences that beehive buzzing feeling. And I'm, I'm just unlucky that it's all the science behind it is they're trying to figure it out and they're trying to figure out how to fix this stuff and stop it, but they really haven't figured it out perfectly. So I got unlucky that I have to deal with that. And then the second one that I deal with is the, I call them zingers. And it's these pains in my toes or the bottom of my foot or my heel. Like it still blows my mind that I can show you on your foot, the exact spot, like within a millimeter of where it just hurt on my foot. And a lot of the time it feels like a hot knife or like a, I always say, if you take a fire poker prod and put it through your foot, it feels like that, but only for a moment and the pain doesn't linger. So it's like a 15 out of 10 pain, but only for a, an eighth of a second. Huh. And so I say if I had a cup of coffee in my hand full to the brim all day, I'd spill it 10 times a day just from going, you know, <clears throat> like it's a full body, like the pain, but then it's gone as fast as it came. So, yeah, those are the two types that I experience. One way to get rid of pain, and I'm sure you had to take a ton of these as painkillers because when you're having something amputated, I can imagine the pain is just something you can't even put a number on. Eventually, when you start taking pill after pill after pill, you get hooked on these pills. And when you really don't have that much to live for, I would think in your head at that point, it's easier and easier for drugs and depression to take over. Is it pretty much once you get home from the hospital or even in the hospital that they dominate your life? Yeah, from as soon as I can remember, like when I start having memories, I was taking cocktails of drugs in the hospital and it just kept going downhill. That's it. Like you're just in so deep. At that point, there wasn't anything to live for, really. So the best I could do was try to numb some of the most ruthless pain in my life with drugs. And they do a good job of it, but you have to keep taking more and more. You know, we all know that spiral. And I got caught in it big time. You know, I wasn't a big drug guy. <laughs> you know, I had some some drinks here and there and smoked a little bit of weed. But, like, it just wasn't my thing. And I always say that the drugs they give you there, the, those drugs, they have talons. And they sink so deep into you that you can't get away from it. And that was it. I was hooked. I was stuck in the spiral. And the fentanyl, the hydromorph, the ketamine, you just want more and more. Trying to run, run away from the pain and then with the depression and all that added in, it's like the only thing really worth looking forward to is trying to take as much drugs as you can. And that lasted a couple of years and it kind of continued to get worse. And I didn't worry about it too much the first year and a half when I still had my left leg because it didn't really matter. Like I just, whatever, it was great to get away from some pain and stuff. But then once I had my second leg amputated, I started seeing potential to do these sports again. And I found a little bit of motivation, a little bit of excitement for life. And that's when I realized that the drugs were a big issue and that, yeah, if I wanted to move forward and get back to the life that 
I used to live and, and do what I wanted to do. I had to get away from them, and that wasn't easy. It's time for my second round of sponsors, and I'm going to start out with the Seattle brand that has been around since 1913. I'm talking about Stanley, and they invented the category of keeping things hot and cold. Sure, there are a ton of overpriced copycats out there, but no one delivers the quality and, most importantly, the ability to keep things hotter or colder for longer than Stanley. I use the water bottles and pint glasses on a daily basis, and on weekends, their food storage solutions are perfect for all the foods you bring to eat at your local ski area. And while I know this won't last forever, the best deal you're going to find on any Stanley products anywhere comes through my podcast. I'm going to save you 30% off everything Stanley. All you need to do is go to Stanley1913.com, go shopping, and when you check out, enter the one word code DRINKFAST to get that deal. If you spend $75, I'll throw in a limited edition Powell Movement beanie. My final sponsor this round is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Peter Glenn has been getting people out there for over 60 years. And whether you're going on vacation or a weekend warrior or ski or ride every day, Peter Glenn has all the brands, all the deals, a knowledgeable staff, a price matching policy, and free shipping on orders of $49 or more. If you're listening to this podcast and need gear, please do me a favor and head on over to peterglenn.com. They have all the deals, and by buying from them, you are supporting the show and keeping it going. So please check out peterglenn.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. So while you're on drugs and while you're depressed, do you realize that this good leg of yours, which is actually your bad leg, the one that hasn't been amputated, do you realize like, hey, for my life to get better, it's got to go? And do you go to the doctors and are like, hey, we just got to cut this thing off so I can kind of get on with my life and I'm not going to be able to move forward until I can get rid of this foot? Yeah, kind of. You know, early on, I like to say I, I gave it everything I could in rehab with that left foot. I put in every last ounce of effort I could. But pretty quickly after, let's say five months, six months after, like I was pretty dead set that that foot was done. And they had actually been taking bones from my right leg that was amputated. And they were rebuilding my left foot with my right leg bones. They were replacing multiple bones with my tib fib from the other side. So you're having all kinds of surgeries and stuff too throughout this whole process? Exactly. They're trying to save it. And, you know, I, whatever, I gave them the benefit of the doubt at first. These are really smart people doing really amazing things. But there was a time where eventually I just went like, this is crazy. And at this point, I have a Franken foot that is so mangled and disformed and like doesn't work, hurt the nerves and stuff in there. The pain in that foot was so incredible. I couldn't touch it to a cold. I couldn't touch it to anything. If I touched it to a cold floor, I'd go through the roof. Oh. And that foot. I had a lot of anger and like anger at the world and it was all kind of bottled up in that foot. Like that foot kind of represented being super disabled and like not capable for the rest of my life. So I pretty early was like motivated to have it amputated, but obviously you got to go through the system and everything and people still had hope for it. So I kept going to rehab. I kept showing up and maybe not with the best attitude, but I did the things that I was supposed to do. I didn't give up on it, but I was pretty like deflated. I, I figured it wasn't going to work out. And then when I was starting to be told like, nah, you know, we're not, can't amputate it. Like we're going to keep going. That's when I started to really get upset. I started pushing pretty hard for it to be amputated. And when that finally got approved and, you know, it's not just like the paperwork comes back with a stamp that says, yes, you can cut it off. But when that process started leaning towards amputation and, everyone was agreeing that it was the best route. I was really excited. Unfortunately, that surgery just kept getting canceled and delayed and put off. And every time I got that phone call for a cancellation on the surgery, it was just another month or two I had to live with that foot. It was getting to me. It was a tough one. Well, you eventually get to have that foot removed. And after you do, you come off of the drugs and you do that cold turkey. And that has to be absolutely miserable. But we're not going to talk about how miserable it is to come off of drugs because the beauty of this is that you've gotten rid of this foot that is like a cancer in your body of just bad vibes and bad karma. And it is now gone. And I think the next big trip that you make is you head to the Adaptive Athletic Foundation in Texas where David Vibora has this program where he takes a shit ton of people like yourself. A lot of guys that are in the military 
everybody's got a stump there, I feel like. Some people don't even have a stump. It's just like they have a torso. And those dudes do shit that they never, ever thought they'd be able to do again. David whips everyone's ass into shape and gives everybody a self-confidence, I feel like, that they couldn't have anywhere else. What is that experience like down there in Texas? Have you ever been through anything that demanding before? Yeah, David is one of a kind. He is such an amazing dude. Does incredible, incredible things for so many people. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to go down there. And he actually got a hold of me in the hospital. And I don't remember our first conversation, but I've been told that I was like, hey, this guy just called me from Texas. Like, you know, like, fuck this guy. You know, I was, <laughs> I was like, who does he think he is pretty much? And yeah, it, it took convincing for me to like believe that it was what I had to do and that I would thrive down there. And when I finally went after that second leg was amputated, which yeah, going in to get my leg amputated, I was smiling in, smiling on the way in, smiling on the way out. Like I've never been so happy in my life. And that was the start of this whole new life. And David was there. He believed in me. It's amazing that he <laughs> picked this random guy up in Canada and he thought I should be there. And that was really cool. It was three months. I got to kind of reinvent myself down there. I got to go away from, you know, all the friends who were feeling bad for me up in Canada and, and uh, put a lot of strain on my family and friends and people having to support me and everything. And David brought me down to Texas and yeah, I just got to completely reinvent myself. And I, I went home an absolutely different person with yeah, just a whole new outlook on potential of what I was going to accomplish with two prosthetic legs after that adaptive training foundation was a huge game changer for me in my recovery. So you leave there with a whole new level of confidence and you're like, when I get home, I'm going to go surfing. And when winter hits, I'm going to figure out how to use a sit ski. Is that kind of what you leave there with? Like kind of that eighties montage of getting yourself back together? Actually, when I was there, I was struggling by myself and I was working really hard. It was really cool, but I was also still battling the demons, the mental battle. And I said to David a couple of times, like I was just kind of, I was pretty lonely down there and just like, I'd go, I'd show up for the workouts and I'd go back to my room, close the blinds, just hide in my hotel room. And he calls me one day, he goes, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, dude, I'm sitting in my room Friday till Monday till I work out on Monday. And he's like, you want to go to California? You want to go to high five surf camp? I was like, well, yeah, but like, I can't afford it. And I don't know, like, no, I'd love to. It sounds cool, but yeah, I probably can't do it. And hey, you still got me there, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm listening. Uh, I'm going to switch my AirPods just died. Okay. Hello. You sound a little different, but it's fine. Yeah. Not the end of the world. Not the end of the world at all. It's a podcast. Who cares? Yeah, right on. Yeah. So I guess High Fives was having a surf camp and I got the invite and DV and I were going to fly out to California for a weekend vacation from. ATF to go surf with high fives. And that was, again, there's so many just like defining moments, but that was so huge to A, be like invited. And they knew that I surfed and I wanted to surf. And then landing in California and meeting Roy, Roy Tuscany, who uh, Trevor Kennison was on that camp. And immediately I found my family there, as Roy calls it, the Ohana, the high fives Ohana. And that was massive for me. So when I went home from Texas, from ATF, I'd been to a high five surf camp. I'd been training for three months with ATF. Like, yeah, I was a completely different person and a hundred percent. It was like, I was ready to take on the world for sure. I was trying to figure out how I'd get back on a skateboard, back on a snowboard. I did my first skydive with two prosthetic legs while I was in Texas. I actually just like took off for a weekend. I didn't really tell anyone what I was doing. And went and pulled that one off and it was complete transformation coming home from ATF. So I have a lot of gratitude for what David's done for me and ATF and all the staff there. It's really amazing what they did for me and what they do for so many people every day in and day out at that place. You mentioned your prosthetics and I would think that there's a choice for you between prosthetics and a wheelchair. And how often are you in a wheelchair compared to walking? You know, walking's super fun. So I try and walk as much as I can, but I'm just not capable of walking all day, every day. And I try and work in my wheelchair as much as possible. I kind of see it as this like currency where I'm saving up my leg time to do things like mountain bike and skydive and surf and whatever it is. So if I'm going to get groceries, I try and do it in my wheelchair. Around the house, I'm always in my wheelchair. 
I try and take as much time or days off as I can. And I have a great relationship with my wheelchair because it's a choice for me. And my chair's there when I need it. And I can use it as a tool. Whereas I think some people, their relationship maybe isn't quite as good with their chair and they see it as having to like give in to their disability or something. So I try and just work it into using it in my daily routine and yeah, traveling. It saves my life. I love my wheelchair. And then I would think with your prosthetics, there's all kinds of pain, sores and discomfort around them. What's that like? Yeah, I'm legs off right now. I'm on a break because my right leg's got some skin breakdown. You know, just getting back from Beijing and that was hard on the body. Every time I go for a World Cup or any snowboard contest, it breaks down my legs pretty hard. Or if I go hard mountain biking for a couple of days or something. Yeah, it's all about maintaining skin and trying to keep your legs healthy. And it's quite the little balancing act. And I'm getting better at it all the time. But with time, your legs get a little stronger, a little more callous. And then also you learn how to maintain your legs and just your body. So uh, get better at it all the time. Yeah, I was going to ask if you built up calluses like guitar guys do with their fingers, but it sounds like you do. Are you ever able to get comfortable? No, <laughs> pretty simply, not really. There's some days where I'm feeling better than others, but generally I just have accepted a certain threshold of pain that I'm okay with. and. I try not to push too far beyond that, and very rarely is it any less than that. So, yeah, it's really unfortunate. I hope with time it just continues to get better, but also I've accepted this kind of level of pain that I live at, and it is what it is. Yeah, and I would say the one last question I have about the prosthetics themselves, do they end up smelling really gnarly after a while? No, you know, people think that all the time, and sometimes nights get weird and we start chugging beers out of my legs and everyone thinks it's pretty <laughs> gross. But, you know, there's a silicone liner that I put over my legs and that's what has the skin contact. And those silicone liners are probably the cleanest things I own. I disinfect them daily. They're washed constantly. My stumps and my liners, I care so much about them because if I were to get an infection or anything, it, it puts me out. I'm done walking. That's it. So the liners can get a little gnarly after a mountain bike ride or something, but no worse than like at the end of a hockey game, your equipment kind of smells and then you hang it out and dry. And it's like if you disinfected your hockey equipment after every game though. Yeah, they're incredibly clean. And then that silicone liner, that's how you connect into your actual prosthetic. You know, there's some dirt and whatever and some rain or whatever gets in and out of there, but it's not that gnarly. They're not as gnarly as you'd think. Okay. And I would think that you get crazy looks when people see your blade legs, but when they can't see them, do people have any clue that there's anything wrong with you? That's a funny one. I wear shorts 95% of the time because, A, I don't give a shit if people see my legs, and I walk pretty weird with my back injury too, and I struggle with lots of things. So up a stair or something, like if I have pants on, I get really strange looks and I'll, I'll stumble sometimes and grab people's shoulders or whatever. If they look over and see two prosthetic legs, there's no questions. If they just see like a 30 year old six foot two guy that just grabbed them or something, you know, take some explaining. I got to immediately explain that I have prosthetic legs. Because it's like a fighting situation if you just grab a stranger. Yeah, totally. So I wear shorts for that reason because it doesn't bother me people looking at them, I would look at them too. And it just takes away any explaining that's required. And it's actually funny. My mom was saying like, you know, do you ever wear pants? And I was like, no, if I wear pants, I have to answer questions all day. And if I wear shorts, no one asks questions because they see, they look, and they usually move on. And some people do, and it's fine. But and she didn't believe me. And I was like, okay, I put on pants and I went, I don't know, we went to the liquor store, I think actually. Yeah. And walking in, the lady asked me if I hurt my ankle. God, no, no, I have two prosthetic legs. Oh my God, that's amazing. Wow. I'm so, I'm so sorry or whatever. You know, everyone says the wrong thing. Right. And then I was like, see, and then I walk into the back and the next lady says something like five minutes. I had to answer two questions. I was like, you wear pants and people are okay to ask you if you like broke your ankle or something, but they're too scared to ask you about the prosthetic legs. So if they can see the legs, I don't have to answer as many questions. And then also, because I have my right leg has some pretty bad skin problems, so 
my legs are off and on as much as possible. As soon as I grab a seat, I pop my right leg off, get some relief from behind my knees and hop in the car, legs off. And if I'm wearing pants, I can't do that. So with the shorts, it just gives me access constantly to my legs. So yeah, long answer to your question is I rarely wear pants. So you can tell I have something wrong because I walk with a pretty weird little dip. All right. Well, you live in a stabbing cabin and you rarely wear pants. So that thing goes together. (laughs) Perfect. And I feel like when you finally get on the water and it sounds like you did that while you were in Texas, but that had to give you a sense of freedom that you might have never thought you'd ever get again. What was that feeling like at high fives when you caught your first wave and you're with a bunch of people that are like you? Does it just give you the feeling of, hey, my life doesn't suck as bad as I might have thought an hour ago? Yeah, totally. It wasn't even catching the wave. That was bonus. I just hadn't had the opportunity really to surf, but I figured if I could get on the water, I knew I was going to be able to surf. I'd watch lots of bilateral amputees that surf really well. So it was just a matter of time. And that opportunity came at a great time super early on. Bigger than that was right away getting picked up at the airport by Roy. And, you know, Roy's a character, you know, Roy. Yeah. That was super cool. And I immediately felt not accepted. That's not the right word, but it just felt normal which was so amazing. And then we went to pick up the rest of the crew and we went and picked up Trevor, chuck his wheelchair in. Hey, what's up? And like now Trevor and I are really good friends. Just FaceTiming him last night. He's up in Revy getting after it. And then we went and met the rest of the crew and went surfing that day. And it's like, okay, yeah, a couple people need a piggyback down. I'm going to have to like crawl. And then we got there and then went surfing. It wasn't like catching the wave that made me feel good. It was that I found a community And I pretty quickly knew that, you know, high fives was going to be my crew. And it was this like realization that I had this whole new community of amazing people that I kind of figured were going to be good friends going forward. And they have been. So that was the coolest part. That's awesome. So you've got that. You've got your community now. And then I think you eventually start sit skiing. But really for you, the passion in life is snowboarding. And I would think that when you shift to snowboarding, that the sport itself would create a lot of new pain for you because when you're sit skiing, you're sitting, but when you're snowboarding, you're bearing that load on your stumps. And does that create new pain, even though it's your passion and you're going to push forward on it? Yeah, I say all the time, thank God I love snowboarding so much because it is the single worst activity for me to be doing. (laughs) It's so painful. Yeah, it's brutal. It's so hard on my legs. At these events we go to, I put my snowboard legs on and then I get in my wheelchair. Like there's no extra walking being done because the amount of wear and tear on my stumps while snowboarding is extreme. So I started off, I went sit skiing, like you said, and it was really cool. Such an awesome experience. I went a handful of times just to get in the mountains. Really, it was my way to get back to like my favorite place on earth. And it was really cool. I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed it but it wasn't snowboarding and it didn't give me that same feeling. It wasn't the thing that I love. So I did it. It got me through that winter. It got me in the mountains with my friends. Everyone was stoked, but in my head, I was just trying to figure out how I'm going to pull this off. How am I going to get on a snowboard? And yeah, the next season it was time to go. And I love sit skiing. And I think in the future, there'll be a time where it becomes my main mode of transportation in the mountains, but I'm going to hold on to snowboarding as long as I can. Well, it seems like in the competitive realm of snowboarding, I mean, you have all this experience your whole life on a snowboard. And while you've lost some of your body parts, that experience still transfers over into the snow. And as long as you can deal with the pain, you can still enjoy yourself on a snowboard and enjoy that feeling. And we had been talking forever about getting you on the podcast. The thing I kept asking you was like, hey, once we figure out when you make the Olympic team or the Paralympic team, we're going to set a date and put you on the podcast. And did you hear that from pretty much everybody? Because I'm sure your goal eventually is set to be like, hey, I want to be a Paralympian. And was that kind of the past two years, you dealing with questions from everybody of, hey, when are you going to make the team? (laughs) Yeah, totally. Have you made the team? Are you going to go to the Paralympics? Yeah. Especially when I started snowboarding, that was like the only question really. And I didn't have an answer for anyone. And I also didn't want to put any expectations on it because I just wanted to really enjoy snowboarding. But I went out with some friends and some people in Calgary that are connected. And I went down one run with a friend of mine, Mike Sastic, And he's like, dude, what the hell are you doing? Like, let's get you going. So 
that day at COP, actually, I went back to COP to ride with some friends and started making some phone calls, you know, try and get into the system and get in the ear of the coach. And yeah, that was pretty cool when that whole process started. And it seems like, because you were injured, what, five years ago? And within five years, you've won a Paralympic gold medal, which we're going to touch on. We're not going to talk about it too much because that's been your whole life right about now. And we're talking about the way that you got to where you are. But everything came together at the right time. You win the world championships and that punches your ticket to go to the games. And when you get to Beijing, is everything bigger than you possibly could have ever imagined? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it's just been such a crazy ride and I'm just strapped in at this point going on it. And this season worked out really well. I had a tough start and learned a lot of lessons at the start of the season with some, some failures. And then Started peaking at the right time, was able to pull off the win at the World Championships and then showing up to the games. It was definitely larger than life. And I don't know, I was just trying to take it all in and enjoy it. Like this is all bonus for me in life at this point. So yeah, it was really cool experience. And I kept saying, everyone's like, oh, you got to try and win a gold, you know, you got it. And I'm like, man, if I strap my snowboard in at the top of a Paralympic snowboard cross course and like drop in, I'm good. Like I did it. I accomplished my goal. Yeah, I'd love to win a medal, but like I just wanted to go there, get to race with these guys that have like motivated me and and pushed me to be a better snowboarder and a better amputee, I guess, over the last four years. And it was just an incredible experience. And when you start the biggest race of your entire life, it's like you tie everything back to what brought you there. And can you describe your pre run routine? Yeah, I man, the pressure is so crazy. And I was trying to just like keep it pretty mellow, pretty easy. But like you said, you're about to drop in for the biggest race of your life. And I had like a couple moments where I'm like, oh, if you just catch an edge, this is all over. Like literally in the next 45 seconds here, it could just be all over if you catch an edge. And that'll be so disheartening. Like that'll be so tough to take. So I was trying to avoid thinking of that. And I really struggled through the season getting in my head and and making mental mistakes, which caused me to, you know, fall while I was, you know, in first or second place. And and those ones are really tough to take. So when I got to the games, I'd been kind of working on some different strategies and how to not think about snowboarding, essentially. And my coach, Greg Picard, he used to be a skydiver and he hasn't jumped in a while, but we kind of tapped into each run was going to be a different skydive. So we just went through the process of a pre-skydive routine, which is very structured how you do that and pretty rigid because of gear checks and everything. And we did gear checks. We did everything all the way up until I was in the gate. Like we talked about exit altitudes, separation, pull time. We ran through an entire skydive as a pre-race routine. So I didn't think once about snowboarding, which is the best place I could be in, was just kind of not thinking about it and just going and riding like I do. And even in the last run, I did a handles check in the gate when the camera came to me, because that's kind of the last thing you do before the door opens. So I checked my handles and the gate went down. And that was the first time I thought about snowboarding pretty much. I was laughing in the start gate thinking like, oh shit, I tapped into something here. (laughs) This is the secret sauce. So I, that was the strongest I've felt all season was the finals of the Paralympics. That's a nice place to be sitting. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly where you want to peak. Your whole life yeah. is like, that's where you want it to shine. So yeah. while it's impossible to put into words, try and describe the feeling of what's going through your mind once you know you've won the gold. Oh, man. So that actually, we can back that up two turns because I, every race kind of had a, on the, my toe side turn and turn four, I was able to look up the track that was kind of my one spot i was able to take a peek before going into the final roller section and in the final race the boys were battling pretty hard behind me in the corner so they lost some time behind me and i was kind of out front by myself well not kind of i was out there by myself and i looked up and went oh sh- oh man i'm out here so that was when i thought holy shit i'm gonna win a gold medal and my knees went jello immediately. <laughs> so I go through turn five. I've watched this video quite a few times this week. And I come out of turn five, heel side turns really strong for me on my heels and start hitting the roller section. And I blow the timing on everything. I'm casing each roller. I'm like getting air. I catch an edge on the top of the camelback feature. And in my head, I had a 20 minute conversation with myself about how I was just cursing myself out. Like, you dumbass. You're going to give this away right now like 200 feet from the finish line. 
And I hit that last jump. My knees popped up to my chest. They were just, my legs were so soft at that point. I couldn't even control them. And when my board went down on the snow, I, I celebrated before the finish line and I wasn't celebrating winning. I was ce- celebrating like getting through that and not fucking it up, not giving it away. <laughs> and I was just so stoked to do it. And it was just a ton of relief when I, I crossed the finish line because that last section, it was maybe 10 seconds. It felt like it was like an hour. That was a wild, wild feeling. Pretty incredible. And I would think life for you becomes batshit crazy for about 24 hours between medal ceremonies and media. Is it just like pandemonium for you? Yeah, it's absolutely insane. But like, I'm there for the whole experience. So I was just stoked. Like it was everything that I kind of thought it might be. And yeah, the, the media car wash is crazy. I made a couple comments that the Canadian media latched onto about playing hockey. So that was pretty cool that that got run pretty far in, in the media. and. I don't know. This is all just such a crazy experience that I didn't expect to happen in this like second period of life here. So it was cool. I was just trying to enjoy it all and super wild and then and then didn't sleep for two days. There was no partying going on in the crazy China Olympics, but I was just was buzzing. I didn't come down for like two days. I couldn't sleep. I was like replaying the race in my brain and with the time chains, trying to catch up with friends and family at like two in the morning. And yeah, that was pretty incredible. And I would think it's probably the first time you really feel famous in your life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is weird. But it's really cool. Yeah, this is a different experience. It's, I don't know. I can't even put it into words, really. Well, you had one race left, and you and I were messaging, and you were like, yeah, everybody's running really fast, and I'm just going to try to do my best and hopefully sneak in for a bronze medal position, but I really don't think anything's going to happen like that. And sure as shit, you end up with the bronze medal. (laughs) And that is uh, your Olympics there. So, I mean, you killed it. You walk away with two medals. And I hate to say you walk away with two medals because that's not what I'm supposed to say to you. But you get out of there with two medals. And at this point, we have the funnest part of the podcast. It's called Inappropriate Questions. And I was able to get a legendary dude to ask your inappropriate questions. He's a guy who defines what border cross is all about in Canada. One of your coaches and an incredible dude and a guy that you asked inappropriate questions to. So Mark Fawcett gets to return the favor to you. And here is Mark's first inappropriate question. Question number one for you, Tyler. I would love to hear your very honest opinion on skiers going switch and riding urban. (laughs) You know what's funny is, yeah, I asked his inappropriate questions and I asked him the same question. And yeah, he pawned it off. But yeah. Let's say I love the hatred. Like, I want the hatred to stay alive between skiers and snowboarders. It sucks that we're all friends these days. And I think that we should go back to the way it was where there's there's a little more angst out there. And yeah, I don't know. I don't need to make enemies, too. I, I have so many amazing skier friends. And I just think that we should have more of a rivalry. All right. Well, you want to bring back the skier snowboarder drama. You're the only person that's ever said that on the show. We're going to jump <laughs> into question number two. Question number two, if you could briefly describe the influence that the movie Point Break had on you, and would Bodhi compete in the Olympics? Uh, Yeah, I mean, Point Break honestly had a massive influence in my life, and I've pretty much lived it out. Like, I I surf and skydive, and Point Break made me want to do exactly what I'm doing today. So I love that movie, and I watch it on repeat often. What do you think of the second rendition of Point Break? Ah, we can't, yeah, don't even, like, throw it out, I don't know. Okay, yeah, the one that starts with, like, a motorcycle guy jumping onto, like, a pad. Yeah, totally, like, amazing athletes doing some really amazing things, but don't try and ruin, like, there was no way that was going to be acceptable. You know, it's like with Swayze movies, you don't remake Roadhouse, you don't remake Point Break. Yeah, you just, yeah, don't touch Swayze. All right, let's go with his third inappropriate question. I know now you're driven to suck the living daylights out of each and every day were you this driven before you were an amputee yeah a hundred percent yeah i don't know what it is man like try and get me to finish an essay and i i can't find the motivation but like i'll just skip sleeping like i would with night shifts and stuff just to go like chase a car or something like if we've got like an extra hour we got to rip for a quick lap on the mountain bike or something i'm an addict i'm fully an addict of like adventure sports and just adventure yeah, they call you the fun hog from what I heard, or the fun <laughs> hog is a hashtag. <sighs> In thinking about that, when you have your life-altering injury, 
it changes everything and it puts you into a category of elite athlete who's a Paralympian. And before your injury, you wouldn't be considered an elite athlete just because, you know, just because you weren't at that point. But when you look back at everything, given you don't want to go through all the pain and you don't want to upset people and go through a lot of the shit that you've done. But when you look at where your life is now, is it almost in a better place after the injury than it was before? Yeah, I mean, my life before was freaking incredible. It was so cool. But this is a whole different level. And I always say that before I did all these sports, I did them as well as I could. And I considered myself a perpetual advanced intermediate, which, you know, with the people I was hanging out with, that's what I was because I was hanging out with people who are like some of the best at what they do. So yeah, it was amazing. My life was super rad. And my life is, again, super rad. There was just this little like dip in the middle. But it's very different. now. <laughs> I don't know. This is it's just something else where I'm sitting right now. I was told there would be a point in my recovery that I would no longer go back to my old life. Or there's potential for that to happen. Like you could get to a point where you've accepted this and your life is what it is. And you could get to a point where you wouldn't trade it in. And I can honestly say I'm at a point where I wouldn't trade like I wouldn't trade for my legs back. I'd probably like try and get rid of like the back injury so I could not deal with that stuff. But yeah, I wouldn't trade my legs in for sure. It's it's pretty crazy to say that. It's amazing where you've gotten yourself, especially mentally. So that's awesome to hear. And we're going to jump into your final question because you do get a bonus question. When Mark Fawcett wants to ask a fourth question, nobody tells <laughs> him no. So here we go. Final question is, while in your hospital bed, having just survived your accident, you had a surprise showing for everyone who came into the hospital. <laughs> what was that? Okay, this is the first legit inappropriate question. I like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my mom's listening, although my mom was very involved with all this. <laughs> but um, let's just say, as I said, I shattered my pelvis into innumerable fractures and all that blood and crazy buildup had to drain out somewhere and it didn't go to the bottom of my legs. So I had to show everyone what was happening with my balls when they came in the hospital, I guess. And so like, yeah, my mom, my girlfriend, my brother, like they'd have to tell me like, hey, like, let's not these friends are coming or whatever. Or, like, you know, this work friends coming, you know, keep the gown on. <laughs> they don't need to see it. <laughs> yeah, but it was I mean, it was incredible, dude. So I had to show everyone that just huge bloody balls. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like beyond huge. Like, yeah. Insane. Oh, man. Well, that was an inappropriate question, and that wraps up Inappropriate Questions and the podcast. And for a dude who had a life-altering accident like yours only five years ago, it's really amazing how far you've come. I mean, if you were still depressed and not doing much, no one would fault you. They'd be like, dude, he doesn't have feet. He's been totally changed. But that's not who you are, man. You push forward, and once I got rid of that second foot, it was like the fun hog came back. And it's amazing, amazing to see that you're not only surviving, but it's like you're thriving and you're doing bigger things than you could ever possibly imagined. And it's just a, a rad story. I'm uh, sad that you had to go through all that pain. I'm glad that you didn't really have to experience it because you weren't awake and aware of what was going on. But man, what you've done with the cards that you were dealt is pretty amazing, man. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mike. You know, I am the Powell Movement's number one fan and listened to it for a long time. And sat there listened to it in the hospital bed too so i really appreciate you having me on this alone makes me feel like i made it so that was time with tyler turner and what a great attitude that guy has i mean can you imagine losing your legs at such a young age i know that like tyler i wouldn't want to live at first but i don't know that i would have the drive to bring my life back to a place that's even better than it was before the accident I guess the lesson here is don't give up and even when things look like they totally suck and life's not worth living that's just a moment in time that we all have to get through. So when you're down, reach out. There are people that want to help. Look at Tyler. He was in an unimaginable place. And sure, things got dark. But he worked his ass off and worked his way out of the darkness. And we're all capable of working our way out of something if we're willing to put in the work. That's what life's about, putting in the work. And that's the podcast. At this point, I want to thank you for listening ask you to review me on Apple Podcasts and to support my great sponsors. They are Rollerblade, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Elon Skis, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and Stanley. 
Have a great week, everyone.